Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Joe Brady, your host today, and our subject today is getting great lab prints, or getting great prints when you send them out to your lab, be it on paper or canvas or whatever. Now, we're going to discuss the issues involved with getting those great prints back from your lab. There's a lot of confusion about this topic, so we're going to try to clear up some misconceptions and get you on the path to getting consistent and accurate great results. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to cover a few points about the basics of color management and discuss some of the issues. Then we're going to talk about your monitor. Your monitor is the single most important component for anyone editing digital files and sending them out to a lab. We're going to discuss if your monitor is helping or hindering your efforts to get that great print. Now, color spaces. Color spaces often get confused with profiles. We'll talk about what part they play in the color workflow. Also, we're going to make sure when we're done, now we have a little checklist that we can go through to make sure that the files we send to the lab come back the way we saw them on our computer display. Now, our goal is to produce consistent color through the process. And as I've talked about before, the problem is every device has its own way or own capabilities of producing, capturing, or representing color. Our cameras can capture pretty much the entire visible light spectrum. Our monitors, well, maybe less so, actually a lot less so. On a laptop, most of them are at sRGB or less. The higher end ones, you might get Adobe RGB out of it. If you've got an inexpensive laptop, all bets are off. <coughs> Excuse me. Really helps to get into a good graphics display. We'll talk about that as well. But as we transfer color from our cameras to our monitors, that's what profiles are going to allow us to do to make sure that color translates from one place to another. Now, since each device has a different range or gamut of color, you need to understand that a color that you do see on your monitor, even when it's calibrated, may not be able to be printed exactly. With the current digital camera technology, as I mentioned, we can capture much more color than our monitors can display. But don't despair. We can get this under control using the profiles, doing soft proofing, and to see how a print will look before we actually send it out to print. So how do you do this? Well, here are some of the points that we'll cover today that are going to allow us to produce that consistent color. As I mentioned, monitor profiling. We're going to make sure that your editing decisions are based on the actual file, not adjusted to your monitor. I want you to understand how to soft proof in both Photoshop and Lightroom. That's going to let you see the quality of your print before you send it out. And I'll talk a little bit about color spaces there and to kind of give you some recommendations for a workflow as to where each color space should be. Now, your monitor is your window to the whole world. It's your viewfinder to everything you do in digital photography. And having a monitor that accurately shows you the correct tonality, contrast, and color that is in your image files is one of the most important pieces in any color workflow. Now, most any monitor is going to greatly benefit from being calibrated and profiled. So let's explore this a little bit more. Monitor brightness is the single biggest issue that I hear from my friends who send out images and they say, oh, my prints came back too dark. Usually, well, 99% of the time, it's because the monitor is set too bright. If your monitor is set too bright, you're editing the image based on what you see. In reality, the file is dark, so you get a dark print back. If you judge your images on a calibrated monitor, then you're going to get prints back that look like your monitor did. Now, the other important setting when you go through this process is the monitor color temperature. Now, there are some people out there, there's some labs out there even, that suggest that your monitor color temperature should be 5,000 K. This is a really bad choice for most monitors. Do not do this. Monitors have a default color temperature of 6,500 K, which is actually even a little brighter, a little bluer than daylight. 5,000 K is designed for the whole pre-press printing world. It's not for photography. It's not for sending out to labs, and it's not for inkjet printing. Also, and there are lots of technical reasons why it happens, but a good monitor calibrated to 6500K, strangely enough, very closely matches a print that is viewed under 5000K lights. You're going to get much better color results throughout the entire tonal range if you leave your monitor at the monitor default, which is going to be 6500K. Now, I talked about having a great monitor. Do you think you have a good monitor? 
Mm, you may. You may have an OK monitor. You may have a questionable monitor. As I mentioned, your monitor really, it's your window to your digital world. And for many of you, it's the weak link in the whole editing color workflow. So what exactly is a good monitor? Here's what it needs to do. It needs to show accurate and consistent color all day long. It needs to be uniform from edge to edge, from side to side. And it also needs to have the ability to show an appropriate luminance or brightness level for photo editing. Now, I'm not going to offer you specific models, uh, but generally, with a monitor, you're going to have to spend about $750 or up to get a truly good professional graphics monitor. In fact, the best ones are going to crack $1,000. But it's a worthwhile investment if you're really serious about printing and you want to get prints back all the time that look like what you see here. Now, a lot of us work on laptops. Can you do your image entity on a laptop? Yes, you can, but you need to understand some things. First of all, most laptops are sRGB, even Apple's new Retina display. Even though it's about 100% RGB, sRGB rather, it's still limited to sRGB. Now, if you're sending out to a lab, in most cases, that is fine. But for inkjet printing, then you're giving up some color there. On the Windows side, they're all over the place. There are Windows machines with Adobe RGB displays, which is great. However, if you get yourself a discount laptop, if you paid $4.99 for your laptop, I guarantee you that the display is probably closer to lousy. In fact, what I've seen, most of the displays on the discount laptops maybe come in at about 60% of sRGB. They have a very limited color gamut, and they're really not good for, for doing editing of your images. If that's the case, you might want to really seriously consider investing in an external monitor that doesn't have those limitations. Also with your laptops, understand, you've got limited viewing angles with most of these screens. As you change your height of your head to the screen or, or go left or right, you're going to see brightness and contrast changes and sometimes even color shifts. So that's why if you're real serious about this, consider investing in a really good graphics display. That will get you a lot closer to where you need to be. So why do we need hardware to do this profiling? Why can't we just use our eyes and make color adjustments? The problem is our eyes are very adaptable to light and color. They'll compensate to those changes automatically. Think about it. You don't really notice the color temperature change if you walk into a room that's brightly lit with tungsten light bulbs, even though, really, the light got very yellow. Also, if you walk into an office, you don't see the strong green component of standard office fluorescent tubes. Your eyes adjust for that automatically. Also, our eyes are affected by the physical state you're in. How much sleep have you had? How much do you need? How much alcohol or caffeine is in your system? and our own individual variations through the course of the day to perceive color. Sounds like a daunting task, but that's what this hardware and software can do. In fact, just to illustrate this point, let's just take a look at a couple of uh, examples that show why your eyes get easily fooled. Now, in this graphic here, if you just stare at it a second, in the circle, it looks like the right half of the circle that is in front of the black patch is lighter than the one on the left, and the longer you stare at it, the lighter the one on the right gets. However, if I pull away the blue bar that was separating the two of them, you can see that they are, in fact, exactly the same color. Here's another example, and this one's uh, even more obvious. You can see that we've got these blue bars, and the ones on the left look much lighter than the ones on the right. You can probably guess what's going to happen. If we pull away the black bars, you get to see that they are, in fact, exactly the same shade of blue. And it's actually, let's have them pass through each other. You can see that is exactly the case. So you can't always trust your eyes because the fact that your eyes are very adaptable. So if you're sending out your files to a lab for your printing, you need a device to calibrate and profile your monitor. Now, we've seen how, I hope you're starting to understand how important monitor calibration is. So we're going to take a quick tour of two options. We're going to look at the, the Color Monkey display, which I've got right here, and the i1 Display Pro. Now, they kind of might look like the same device. They're different colors. They actually, hardware-wise, are very close. The real difference is in the software they use. The Color Monkey display uses a very simple automated system, although it's very powerful. It really takes 
any of the thinking out of your hands. You don't need any color expertise. Just follow what it says on the screen and you're gonna get a great profile. For those of you that are into details, you like the tech stuff, you like the numbers, you wanna really see what's going on, you can dig in deeper with the iOne Display Pro because of the software it uses, something called iOne Profiler. So this is not meant to be a training or a full introduction of both of these devices, the Color Monkey Display and the iOne Display Pro. We have webinars dedicated to those details. In fact, we'll include those links to our follow-up. However, I would like to give you a quick overview of the basic and advanced modes of operation that these devices can do, and then we'll continue on into our editing software. As I mentioned, we're gonna go both into Photoshop and into Lightroom. So let's take a look at the basics first. With uh, We're gonna use the i1 Display Pro and see what it can do. Let's go ahead and get our monitor profiled. Now I've got the i1 Display Pro here. Uh, we've also taken a look at the Color Monkey display. In the basic mode, they both operate very similarly. They have the same kind of uh, capabilities. Uh, just the interface looks a little different. Now the i1 Display Pro with its i1, i1 Profiler software does offer some advanced options, which we'll take a look at in a minute. So let's go ahead over to the left and we see the options. We have display and projector profiling. Also notice it says printer and scanner profiling with demo vans across it. This is because this is the same software that the i1 Pro 2 uses. That's a completely different piece of hardware that can do printer profiling and scanner profiling. We'll explore that a little bit when we do our session on fine art printing. But let's just do a basic display profile. So we click on there. Uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna go ahead and measure the luminance of the ambient light. So I've got the i1 Display Pro connected to my computer. Right next to my monitor, I just click on measure. And what this will do is it'll measure the brightness of the ambient light. It will adjust accordingly so that the screen luminance is appropriate for the ambient light. So then I can just click on next and it shows me the patch set that it's going to use. I do want automatic display control turned on over here. What that's going to do is take control of the computer's uh, brightness, luminance, all by itself. You're not going to have to do anything. Just click the buttons and let it do its magic. So I'm going to click on start measurement. And it directs you to flip the diffuser panel around on the i1 Display Pro. And as soon as it sees that you've done that, you just hang it from the middle of your screen. Make sure it's flush and click on next. Now the first thing it's going to do is take care of that automatic display control and it's going to optimize the brightness of your display so that based on the ambient light and what your monitor is going to do it's going to give you the best view back as far as brightness goes. This is the one area that causes the most problems for people because their monitor's too bright and you send it out to a lab and you end up getting prints back that are too dark. Now after it's done with the ADC control, it's going to go on to the profiling part. That's when it starts sending colors up to the screen. It's going to measure the colors, it's going to compare them what's expected, and it's going to create a profile from that. Remember a profile is a set of corrections so that when your software asks for a certain color and the hardware gave it something a little bit different, it's going to correct for that. This process takes a couple of minutes and we'll just let it run its course. All right, the profiling's done. Now it's asking us to flip the diffuser back over top of the i1 Display Pro and just place it next to the monitor. Now we can click on Next and give it a name. I'm gonna call it i1 DP and I'll call it Basic. You can set a profile reminder for one, two, three, or four weeks. And you can also have it monitor the ambient light. So if there's a big change in the room light, it will adjust the profiling accordingly. So I could turn this on and say, oh, check it every 30 minutes. Then create and save the profile. And it goes ahead and generates it, puts it into action, and really you're done. If you'd like to check, up here you have a before and after button along with a whole bunch of sample images. You might see your monitor has gone more yellow and darker, and that's to be expected because now what you're seeing is an actual accurate representation of the data in your file. So before we continue on, a couple of questions, and good questions. By the way, again, if you've joined us late, there's a chat room there. Go ahead, take advantage of it. I'm taking some of your questions live. There are people in there that can help, and you can also chat with each other, so definitely do that. First good question, somebody asks, if you shoot raw, does it matter if you set your camera to Adobe RGB or sRGB? The answer is no, it doesn't matter. Because those, those settings in your camera, that choice between color spaces, 
is only for JPEGs. When you're shooting raw, there is no color space. That color space doesn't get assigned until you've processed the file either through Lightroom and exported it or through Adobe Camera Raw and then opened it up in Photoshop. Until that point, it doesn't have a color space assigned to it. It's basically the entire visible light spectrum. Uh, some of you are having problems calibrating very specific laptops. There's so many different video cards out there, it's hard for me to tell you exactly. Uh, someone did mention that they're, they're calibrating, uh, if they calibrate their laptop to 6500K, it goes very yellow, and they're getting better results when they use a native temperature with laptops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two things could be going on here. Yet one, yes, it's possible that the native display on your laptop is not 6500K. Some of them are a little lower, some of them are 61, 6200K. So if that's the case, you may find it goes a little bit yellow. So yes, try the native setting instead of 6500K. The other possibility is it depends on the operating system you're using. If you're using a little bit older operating system, there are two different types of profiles that are created from these systems, and you can see this in the preferences in the software. There's version two profiles and version four profiles. Now, version four profiles are the latest. They're a little bit more accurate. However, older operating systems have trouble with them. So you might want to go back in and set your profile type to a version two profile instead of a four, and that might eliminate all those problems. So give that a try. Now, someone said, how do I set my monitor to 6500K? Uh, the one I'm using doesn't have that option. You don't need to set your monitor to anything. You just leave your monitor on its defaults. The software for either ColorMonkey Display or i1 Display Pro will do that for you. You just leave it on its defaults and the software will take over. I'm just recommending that in the software that you use here, choose 6500K. Again, unless you're having a trouble, but remember, two possibilities version four versus version two profiles, or your native monitor temperature is lower. It's probably the version four, version two problem. So in the software's preferences, you can go in and change that. Uh, someone asked, they said, uh, my, my understanding was that as long as your monitor's calibrated, you'll be okay. However, it sounds as if you have a standard monitor, calibrating is a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. Calibrating your monitor is gonna get it into its best possible state. It's gonna give you the most accurate color it can do. Just understand, and there's some common sense here, if you have a really inexpensive monitor, it's inexpensive for a reason. It has limitations in its color gamut and the quality of the display panel. There's a reason, I have a, somebody asked about a specific brand recommendation. I don't usually like to do that. I'll give you two. The high-end NEC monitors, and ASOs, I'm a big fan of the ASO monitors. This is an ASO CG241W. Had this monitor for a couple of years now. This is a professional graphics display, but these monitors are 15 to $1,700. But there's a reason for that. It's uniform edge to edge, side to side. It doesn't fluctuate at all. This laptop, when you take a look, I'm gonna show you some of the advanced properties of the i1 Display Pro. When you see how much my MacBook Pro monitor fluctuates from edge to edge, it's gonna be ridiculous. So you're gonna see why you wanna have a good monitor for real serious editing. Uh, someone asked, can you use a big screen TV as a monitor? You can, but they're awful. Uh, the color gamut on those is generally really bad unless you have a very expensive TV. Uh, so it's good for projecting, for showing, you know, just you wanna show a slideshow maybe, but for judging color, not a good idea. Uh, someone asked, can you use um, uh, Adobe Photoshop Elements instead of uh, Photoshop or Lightroom with your profiles? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and is, another question, is there an option to calibrate with the lights off? Um, there actually is no reason to do that. But the calibrators, when you put them on the screen, they are flush, so they don't care about the light off. Now, they do measure ambient light, but the lowest they're ever gonna set your monitor is at 80 candelas. If you're working in a very dark room, that's where you're gonna wanna be or a dimly lit room. After that, it's gonna go a little higher. All right, we're gonna continue on. There's a couple more questions I'm gonna come back to, but I wanna show you uh, some of the advanced stuff that uh, actually both the Color Monkey Display and the i1 Display Pro can do. Because if you're really into seeing what state your monitor is in, you're gonna be surprised what you see what I, what you see what I got out of my laptop. Let's take a look at that. 
One of the advanced options that the i1 profiler software offers you is the ability to measure many more patches. You see the small set, which we saw before of 118. There's also medium, which doubles that almost, and then large, which gives you a lot of patches. If you've got a really high end graphics display, having more patches will squeeze a little bit more gamut and a little more color accuracy out of it. If you're dealing with a laptop or a generic display, you're probably not going to gain too much of an advantage. So just for speed's sake, I'll leave it on small. You also have the ability to add colors. You can actually add an image in here and the software will extract colors out of that image. So it has extra data for that type of imagery. Also while you're here, you can add colors from the Pantone Color Manager. You can load spot colors in. So say for example you're doing a commercial piece and you have a company's logo color. That's a Pantone color. You can actually load that in so the software knows specifically how to deal with that color. And again, we're not going to actually go ahead and do that. Let's just continue on. And like before, you would just click on Start Measurement. And again, we have Automatic Display Control on. Now everything we've seen up to this point, the Color Monkey display does as well. Let's go back to the home page and take a look at some of the advanced options. First of all is quality. What you can do is actually measure against different targets. For example, here's the X-Rite color checker. So let's go ahead and measure the colors for that and see how it does. So we'll click on start measurement again, flip over the diffuser, hang it on the screen. And what we get are specifically the colors for the X-Rite color checker. And it will take the profile that is created, measure these colors, and take a look and see how accurate the profile is within the abilities of this particular monitor. All right, now, so we can click on Next. And we'll get a report to tell us which colors are good and which might be a little bit questionable. There's nothing you can do for this, however, because it's just showing you the limitations of your monitor. And we're dealing with a laptop here, so it does not have the display capabilities that a high-end graphics display has. And you can add it to trending. So what it allows you to do is you can actually measure over time if your monitor is changing. Now one of the fun things to look, actually fun and then sometimes you don't like seeing the results, is uniformity. And what uniformity allows you to do is actually measure different parts of your screen to see how uniform your display is. So when I click on next, it tells me start the measurement and it directs you where to put the device on your screen. So I'll go ahead and measure it in each of these locations. So we've got our measurements done and let's take a look at the results and you can see here when we click on next it gives us a report. Here's our luminance. So in the middle we got 78 candelas and we were shooting for 80 which is really good. However look at the bottom left of my monitor. When the center is at 80 the bottom left is only at 54. It's 24 candelas off. Again there's nothing you can actually do about that but what it's showing you is that the laptop screens are not particularly uniform from corner to corner. And this has gotten better with the newer screens, but this is kind of interesting information to have. You can also do the same thing for white point. Now we were at 6300K here. Notice it's dropped all the way down to 5900 and it's showing us the left side of my particular laptop here is not particularly accurate either in color or in luminance. So that's something to keep in mind when you're doing your serious edits. And this is something that is exclusive to the i1 profiler software and the i1 Display Pro. Now, if you're not into these numbers, if you don't want to do huge patch sets when you're doing your monitor calibration, and you just wanted to do it and leave you alone, that's where the Color Monkey Display comes in, and it will do all that beautifully for you. If you like lots of data and you really want to see what's going on with your monitor, the i1 Display Pro will provide you all of these extra tools to give you that information if that's what you want. So isn't it crazy how far off my little 13-inch laptop is from side to side? That's really crazy. I know that if I'm doing serious editing, and I do a lot of traveling, so maybe I'll be using my laptop on an airplane, I need to make sure that I'm looking at the serious part I'm editing in the middle of the screen. A couple of really good questions came through. Uh, someone asked first that if you have an older Color Monkey design or Color Monkey photo, are the profiles that those create as accurate as the new devices? And the answer is pretty much so. Yeah, those, those devices are very good. The new devices have some interesting options, but the profiles that the Color Monkey Photo and Design create are very good. Okay, uh, someone asked, if you calibrate the display in a profile printer with a Color Monkey 
and then recalibrate this display with an i1 Pro, do you need to reprofile the printer? And the answer to that is no. Even though the software says match my monitor or my printer to my display, they actually are never even talking to each other. What's really going on is you're calibrating your display so that it's correct, you're calibrating your printer that it's correct, and then the profile translates from one space to another. So your printer actually has no idea that there's even a display there, so that's not, not something you need to worry about. Now, here's an interesting question. So somebody's ordering prints on aluminum, and they said there's a lack of ICC profiles for this printing process. And some of the labs will offer to send you prints or files, and you're supposed to bring it up on your monitor and adjust. Um, what I'm going to, and they ask, why are ICC profiles so hard to obtain? And what I'll, what I'll say is there's no need. You don't need to have a profile for your lab. You're going to see this when we go into Photoshop and we do our conversion from uh, ProPhoto RGB into sRGB, that that's all you need to do to get accurate prints from your lab. You don't need to have a lab's profile to make that happen. The lab machinery knows how to make that happen. Uh, one other thing, someone said uh, they calibrated their 21-inch iMac with the Color Monkey display, and the prints are still coming out dark. Two questions I'd have for you. There were a series of 21-inch iMacs that were problematic, that were overly bright, and no matter what you did, you had trouble getting them down dark enough. So I'll, when we send our, our follow-up, there'll be a, a place you can send in questions. I'd be curious, after you run the profile, at what candelas is it coming back at? If it's over 120, then you might have one of those problem units, and you're going to have to use some kind of utility to further darken that. Uh, there is a utility out there called Shades. You can just search it, Shades Monitor Darkening, uh, in Google, and it'll come back and show you. It causes some color issues, but it will allow you to adjust brightness. However, there's another possibility that's very common, and I forgot to mention that. In fact, Jen, let's show my laptop screen. I want to show you something here. When you go into the control panel on the Mac and you have your display, there is a button. Any of the computers that have the built-in cameras have this automatically adjust brightness button. They actually use the internal camera <coughs> excuse me, to measure the ambient light, and it will adjust the brightness. It overrides everything you did as far as getting your brightness under control. So make sure that this automatically adjust brightness button is not checked. That will cause trouble. Okay, let's see. Uh, there are some of you that are having specific issues with specific de devices and specific operating systems. We'll give you an email address for that. That's getting a little too detailed for today. Uh, but what I want to do next is go into Photoshop. First thing I want you to see are the color settings in Photoshop. I'm going to give you a recommended workflow. You don't have to follow this, but I'll, I find this works because it gives you a lot of flexibility. You're going to set up Photoshop for ProPhoto RGB as its default color space. We're going to do our edits, but we're going to soft proof to sRGB, make any necessary adjustments, and then do a conversion. That's the file we'll send out to our lab. So if you go through the process of having your monitor calibrated, set up Photoshop, do this conversion, view the image on the screen, make any adjustments you feel necessary. If you send that file with that embedded sRGB profile out of your calibrated monitor, you're going to get a print back that looks like you see on your screen. So let's go into Photoshop. I'm going to use CS6. It's the same back several versions. And let's see that process. Before we prepare our image to be sent out to the lab, we need to check Photoshop's color settings. And that's under Edit. If you come down here, or it's Command-Shift-K, or Control-Shift-K on a Windows machine, and you need to set up your color settings for your workflow. Now, these are kind of important to know. Here's what I'm going to recommend. There's lots of different theories and, and opinions about this, but here's what I'm going to recommend. For your working space, stay in ProPhoto RGB. It's the largest space that Photoshop has to work with. The reason for that is you're going to maintain all your data, the best color space, for who knows where later you might send this image. CMYK, gray, and spot do not concern us as photographers. They're more printing things for pre-press, so you can ignore those. But we do want to concern ourselves with, with color management policies here. And the most important is to preserve the embedded profile. So when we bring in an image, regardless of what profile it is in when we get it, we can at least leave it where it is because we don't want to be changing profiles without knowing that we're doing so.
Now there are more options. We could click on more options here and there's lots of other stuff down here. But again, the defaults are going to be fine. So I'd recommend you don't concern yourself with them. Just make sure your working space is Profoto RGB. RGB rather. Now if you bring in an sRGB file or an Adobe RGB file into Photoshop and you have preserve embedded profiles chosen, it's going to stay there. So there's no worries there. So let's hit OK. And let's take a look at soft proofing from Profoto RGB to sRGB. So we go from View, Proof Setup, Custom, and we see that this image is in Profoto RGB. And because it's the largest color space available, when we change from perceptual to relative color metric, nothing's going to happen. All of the colors in this image are contained in that space. Now what we want to do is we want to send this image to sRGB. Here's where it becomes a little bit of a challenge, particularly when you're dealing with a laptop, because this display can only show us sRGB. That's what the laptop is by definition. So if we go to device to simulate and choose sRGB, now we can switch back and forth from perceptual to relative, but in this case, we're not seeing any change in the image, even though I know there are colors in this image that are going to change. Why is that? Well, they're colors that are beyond the display's capability to actually show us. And we can see that by going up to View, Gamut Warning. And see all that stuff that just turned green? Those are colors that are in this image that are beyond sRGB. They're beyond the ability of this display to show us. Now, if we were sending out to an inkjet printer, it would have the ability to print the true color that is underneath this green warning. When we're sending out to a lab, however, most lab machinery, most lab printers work in sRGB or something very close to it. So I'm going to turn off the gamut warning because what I need to do is convert this image to sRGB. Now it's going to look like we see it on the screen. That's okay. But just understand that if we were to print this on a, on a big inkjet printer, that we actually might get a more intense blue and a more intense kind of orange in here. Uh, this is West Minton in Monument Valley. Uh, you're going to get a little bit more color out of it because the printer has a bigger color space. So here's the procedure. Edit. Convert to Profile. And we're going to go from Profoto to sRGB. Now in this case, we didn't see any change between relative color metric and perceptual. So for this particular image, it doesn't matter. In other images, you may see a change, so pick the one that looks the way you like. Yes, leave black point compensation on. Uh, flatten image is up to you. Well, I'm just going to leave it off for now, and I'm going to hit OK. And now the image is converted to sRGB, and you might have seen a very slight jump in brightness. So let me undo that. See, it's got a little bit brighter along the sky here. It lost a little bit of intensity, and that's kind of showing us a little better the effect of going to sRGB. Now we're looking at this image in sRGB. So let's take another look at proof setup here, and now see if we see a difference between relative and perceptual. And again, no, because when we did our conversion to sRGB, all the colors that were out of gamut from Profoto got converted the same when we went into sRGB. So now we have an sRGB file but now we need to prepare it for sending out to our lab. And I find most of the labs work really well with high quality JPEGs in sRGB. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to click on Save As, and I'm going to save this into a folder on my desktop called For the Lab. And I'm just going to call it MV Sunset for now. And I'm going to save it as a JPEG file. Now notice on embed color profile it now has the sRGB file. So when I click Save it's going to come back with a dialog. I want to send it at its highest quality. Click OK and now I've got an image that is ready for my lab. Now notice I still have all my layers here from my original Photoshop file. I could go back uh, to change back to its original file and nothing has been hurt because I did that save as. If you follow this procedure, that JPEG in high quality with that sRGB conversion is going to come back to you looking just like it did on the screen. All right, lots of great questions. Uh, so let's continue on. Um, somebody asked, can you successfully use a high quality monitor with a good laptop? The answer is absolutely. 
The limitation is not the graphics card in the computer. They're pretty good. It's just a limitation of the laptop display. You can see here, I've got this Azo monitor plugged into my MacBook Pro. It could be a Dell or NEC or Sony or Samsung or whatever you've got. As long as it's got a decent video card in it, it will drive a good monitor with no problems at all. Uh, somebody's an Aperture user, uh, will the same calibration process work with Aperture? Absolutely. This process is system level, so any software you're gonna use is gonna take advantage of that. Uh, someone's mentioned they're using a Color Monkey Photo with an ASO. Uh, will it handle the same luminance and white point data? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of you are having issues specifically with some variations on Windows. I'm gonna direct you to xwritephoto.com. Go under their tech support. There's all kinds of FAQs and specific troubleshooting things for specific operating systems. Let's see, uh, someone asked, can I do the same conversion to sRGB in Lightroom? Coming up, stay tuned, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, another question, uh, am I using the Mavericks operating system and are there any issues specific to it? Yes, I am using Mavericks and yes, there are some issues. With certain of the softwares, in fact, the Color Monkey Display and the i1 Display Pro, on xwritephoto.com, there's an update to a software and it's called an XRD file. It's an X-Rite Devices file, and there's an update that monitors uh, everything that's going on with Mavericks and makes this work. So if you've upgraded to Mavericks and you, you're using one of these devices or want to, go on the device-specific product support page, and you'll see the link to upgrade uh, that file so that everything works fine with Mavericks. I am in Mavericks. I ran both of these devices just yesterday, and they work perfectly with that upgrade. Uh, <clears throat> any difference with the Retina display? No. Retina display works just fine. Let's see. Um, okay, someone says when they see, when they set the uh, monitor to the pro photo color space, when they're viewing JPEGs, they seem overly saturated and it seems to be a color cast. Shouldn't be any reason for that because JPEGs, uh, um, if they're showing that kind of problem, that means there was a problem in the original file. So the specific question, what I'd ask is, Send me one of those JPEGs. I'll take a look at them and let you know. Uh, another question says, my Color Monkey recommended 80 as the default brightness based on my room, but my prints are coming up much too light. If I raise the calibration brightness to 100, will that make the prints darker? That's very unusual. Uh, 80 is really the ideal spot to be if the room is dark enough and your prints should not be coming out too light. Uh, I would, that's a question I would ask when we send the follow-up. Send us your specific computer and monitor system and operating system that you're using uh, because having your monitor set at 80 candela, which is pretty dim, uh, but in a dark room it looks perfect and it's usually the best setting for any monitor. Uh, somebody asked about it, do I have a default recommendation for laptops and external monitors? If you have to pick one, I'd recommend your laptop at 100 candelas. This is just me speaking, it's nothing official. But I found that to be a good compromise. Uh, at 120 and higher, your shadows start to get a little bit too light. They will generally print darker. Uh, 80 is great, but it's kind of dim in a brightly lit area. So 100 is my go-to default. And on a monitor like this, again, this is usually in a darker area for me. I'll be at 80, occasionally 100, rarely above that. All right, let's move on. We've talked about Photoshop. Now, a couple of you have already asked about Lightroom. Lightroom handles color differently. You have to understand that Lightroom does two things. One, it's an image database program, and two, it's one big, giant Adobe Camera Raw. When you work on a file in Lightroom, you're working on that raw file. You're not actually doing anything to it, however. You're setting up a set of conditions that will be applied to that file when you export it and that includes the color space. Now, you saw the color settings in Photoshop where I went through setting up for Pro Photo RGB. In Lightroom, there's no need to do that because you can't. Lightroom, by default, works in, well, it's actually a slight variation on Pro Photo RGB. It's called behind the scenes Lisa RGB, uh, but it is, for all intents and purposes, the Pro Photo RGB space. You select your color space in Lightroom when you actually export the file to another file type, and you're about to see that. Um, one other thing, if you're using different versions of Photoshop in Lightroom, one of the things that happened 
with Lightroom 5 and CS6 is for the first time, finally, Photoshop and Lightroom use the exact, exact same color engine behind the scenes. If you have an older version of Lightroom and Photoshop, you might have noticed if you went from Lightroom into Photoshop, there was a color shift. When you went into Photoshop, that was bad. That's because they use different color engines. They're now in sync. So that's the beauty of having CS6 and Lightroom 5. No more of that. So let's go into Lightroom. Lightroom now has soft proofing available. Uh, we're going to go through the same process, soft proofing. We're going to export to sRGB. Let's see how Lightroom does that. Now soft proofing and preparing for a lab from Lightroom is a little bit different kind of thing. So here we are in the develop module and I've got this interesting image of this is Balancing Rock in uh, Arches National Park and you see there's a button right on the bottom called soft proofing. Now if you take a look up here at the histogram you're going to see some number changes when we click on here. So let's click on there and you notice now we've got, now let's go back on it, we'll ignore that. So we click on soft proofing and you see create proof copy. So let's do that and we'll create a copy with the profile which in this case again is sRGB. Now we can click perceptual relative to see if we see much of a change and I'm flipping back and forth I'm not really seeing one. Now understand also Lightroom always works in a version of Profoto RGB behind the scenes. However we also have the added advantage of right up in here is the gamut warning for the destination. In this case, in that conversion to sRGB, what colors are going to change? And we can see we've got a lot of color that is in Profoto RGB that is not in sRGB. Again, on our display, unfortunately, we can't really see the difference because it's an sRGB display. So what can we do? Well, we could just leave it alone and the image is going to print pretty much like you see it here. If you wanted a little more control over it, you could come down to Hue Saturation Luminance and typically it's the saturation or the hue that's causing it to be out of gamut. So if I click on the targeted adjustment tool here, come up into that red area and just drag down a little bit, you see it's starting to disappear and you're actually really not even seeing it on the screen. But what this is doing is it's giving you a little more control. In fact, let's zoom in on the image and kind of go over to the rock here. We see some of this orange is a little bit out of gamut as well. So I can do the same thing. I can bring down the saturation a little bit of just in this color until it starts to disappear. Now I don't need to get rid of all of it. I'm just going to get rid of some of it. It's okay to leave a little bit of that red indicator left. Now again, if I turn this on and off, we're not going to really see an enormous difference before where we started and where we are now because the display is in sRGB. But by doing this control, you do have the option of taking a little bit better control of the image. So now if I'm, if I'm happy with this image, uh, I could decide I wanted to make some more adjustments. So I can see here, I've got a little bit of red left in the, up in the sky. Again, that's okay. A little bit down in the trees. Doesn't really concern me because I am looking at this through sRGB and I've brought down some of the saturation. I may decide while I'm in here, well, I like it, but now I think it needs a little bit more contrast. So I can add a little more contrast to the image, add a little more pop. And because I did that, I'm going to add a little bit more brightness. And again, this is kind of setting the mood. It's to flavor. Okay, so I like this. Remember, we created a proof preview copy. If I show my uh, uh, film strip down here, you can see here's my sRGB copy versus the one, the original one we started on. Subtle difference because we increase that contrast and brightness. I like the way this looks. I want to send this out to print. Now remember in Lightroom you're always working on the raw file. What I need to do is export this. So I'm going to click on export and here's where we're going to choose our color space. I'm going to choose my same folder that I did for Photoshop which is on my desktop. Let me click on there. Here's my lab file. I'll choose that. I can rename it. I'll call it, oh, let me call it Balancing Rock. Scroll down. I want to send them a JPEG. Uh, I don't want to, I do want the highest quality. 
I'm not going to resize it to fit. I want to send it out at the full size. I don't want any watermarking or anything else. That's it. I've got a full quality JPEG in sRGB. Click on export. Lightroom does its magic, sends it into that folder. And then as I do my edits and add my images to this folder, I will have images that are perfectly prepared for the lab. And I know that what I'm going to get is going to look just like I see on the screen. All right, just a couple of questions more to, to answer before we get close to finishing up. Uh, someone asked, it's a good question, are there any problems in a room with two different lighting scenarios? For example, during the day, or at daylight and tungsten in the evening. Now, one of the things about when you're setting up your workspace is it's really handy to have a hood on your monitor. If you could see it, I'll, I'll spin my ASO around a little, but you can see that there's a hood on this. This protects the monitor from overhead lights that might have a color cast to them. Now, if you don't have one of these, you might want to consider either making yourself one or just having the monitor faced away from the lights. Now, if you're working on a laptop or that's not something that's convenient, you might have noticed, that, depending on how closely you were looking, in the i1 profiler software uh, for the i1 Display Pro, there is an option to measure the ambient light and actually measure its color temperature and if there's any kind of color spikes and it will affect the profile accordingly. Uh, so if you are in that situation, then the i1 Display Pro might be the way for you to go. Again, today isn't meant as a, as a detailed demonstration of the capabilities of all these systems. We're sending you links to those if you want to dig deeper. Uh, it was a good question, though. Uh, again, someone asked, they, they said they want to mention, uh, they want to order metal prints and there aren't any profiles offered. So how do I proof in Photoshop CC or Creative Cloud? Uh, it's exactly the same way we just did it. Again, a calibrated sRGB file is going to work. Uh, the, I'm not sure of the gamut of the metal prints, and I'm not sure of the devices that are printing on them. That's something you should, a conversation you've had with your lab. And along with that, someone said, are there any professional labs that work with ProPhoto RGB? It's not the lab's decision. It's not their problem that is limiting that color space. It's the actual printers being used. It's how they operate. It's how that world is operated for many years. When you have a print printed on a conventional photo printer that these labs use, the color space of these devices is something very close to sRGB. It's just the way they're made. Now, there are some really high-end printers that can go to Adobe RGB. And if you're sending it out to a lab and having, say, big inkjet prints done, for example, my Canon 6350 at home uses 12 inks. I've created profiles for that. And in many cases, it can print way beyond Adobe RGB. So in that case, I do send that printer ProPhoto RGB files. It's a conversation to have with your lab. If Again, if you're having conventional prints done, it's not their limitation, it's a limitation of the device and the software that drives them. So that's, that's where this whole sRGB thing is coming from. It's just the way of the world and it's the, the way we've gotten photographic prints for many years. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, if the lab supplies a profile, should you use the same workflow but use the lab's profile instead of sRGB? You can do that. There are a couple of labs that will offer you the profile for their actual device. I'd be surprised if they're very different than sRGB, and you're going to have, have a good monitor to see the difference. But certainly, yes, it's not going to hurt. If they offer that, give it a try. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question somebody asked that uh, this is getting a little more detail in the software. Someone asked, am I concerned about the contrast range in the histograms that I'm using? Uh, I said, to them, it appears that I'm, I'm going to lose detail on both the shoulder and on the toe, I mean, the highlights and shadows. Uh, that's a good point. Actually, uh, Jen, if you would just show my screen a second. Let me bring this up. We're going to take a look in Lightroom. If you take a look at my histogram over here, let me make this a little bigger. If you take a look at my histogram, uh, I do have the ability to see if I have any clipping going on. And if you look right there, when I show the shadow clipping, I am getting a little bit pure black right in this post of this, this uh, piece of rock there. I'm more concerned about highlights. And if I go to my highlight clipping, I see there isn't any. All of that red has disappeared. So I'm not concerned about my highlights. They will all print. Now, there's a very little bit of pure black in there. Does that concern me? Actually, I, sent up, I set up this file for printing on my inkjet printer. 
and inkjet printers like to have a little bit of pure black. It, it does look good. If you're going out to a lab, that's something you have to decide. Uh, maybe in this case, if I was sending this out for a standard lab print, maybe I would go in and just bring my black slider up just a little bit to get rid of that. But I want to take advantage of the full range that I've got in this image. I want to go almost to pure white and almost to pure black without clipping. Uh, and that will give me a great file. Uh, there's no reason for me to play it safe and bring them in further than that because the printers have the ability to, to handle that kind of tonal range. Uh, good question though. Let's see, what else have we got? Because we're getting close to the end here. Uh, oh, here, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Someone said that they heard you should print in the CMYK color space. Is that a myth? If so, when do you change to that color space? For photographers, for going out to a lab, you can forget the word CM, or the phrase or the color space CMYK even exists. There are some very specific times when CMYK is used. One, large inkjet printers that are using a rip will take advantage of some things that CMYK offers. That's the, pretty much the only time that you're going to encounter it. If you're going out, I just looked behind me, I thought I had my inkjet printer here, it's not here. Well, even though your inkjet printer on your desk or in your office has CMYK inks, the software is expecting an RGB file. They don't play nice with CMYK files, so don't go there. The software wants an RGB file to convert internally in the printer. The only other time you might deal with CMYK is if you're going out to pre-press for conventional printing on an offset press. Even today, most digital presses, if you send out a book to Blurb or Apple's iBooks, something like that, even though those, those printers are going to, again, use CMYK inks, they're expecting RGB files in most cases. So CMYK is something limited to pre-press at this point in the evolution of color. So as a photographer going out to an inkjet, sending it out to a lab, don't even concern yourself with it. But good question. Uh, let's see, okay, someone said they've got two lower end monitors next to each other, uh, they're, but they're the same brand. They calibrate them both and one is yellower than the other. This, and is this the calibration or the monitor? It's the monitor. When you have a low end monitor, you're never gonna get them to match, even if you calibrate them to the exact same specifications because the manufacturing variation is so great on that type of monitor. You're gonna to have to go up to a high-end monitor like this one here, like this Azo, to get two monitors that are going to exactly match. That's something else you get when you go to the high-end because they're manufactured to much more exacting specifications. So just understand that that is a limitation. If you're dealing with, you, you go out buy a discount monitor for $399, you can buy two match, two exact same ones in boxes next to each other on the shelf. Even after calibration, they're not gonna match. So this is just a fact of life. So let's finish up, I'm about out of time. Let's just summarize kind of the whole soft proofing. We've gone through it in Photoshop. We've seen how to convert a file from its embedded space or the working space into sRGB. You don't have to have a profile from your lab. The lab equipment software knows how to convert a good sRGB file that you've calibrated based on what you've seen on your monitor into their printer's color space. Now, some labs do offer a profile for their system, but regardless, it should not be necessary. You give them a profiled file off a calibrated monitor with that sRGB file embedded into it that you've edited according to that profiled monitor, and you're gonna get back a print that very closely matches what you see on your screen. I always put that caveat in, closely matches, because remember, you looking on your monitor at something that's backlit with a daylight set of lights versus a print that is reflecting the ambient light that could be anything from tungsten to fluorescent to daylight. So within those limitations, you're gonna get a very close result. What we're gonna do in our next session is we are gonna take things one step further. We're gonna say, well, what if I've got a print, I've got this image on my screen and I know when I print it, it's then going to be displayed under tungsten lights like we have in here on our studio. What's going to happen to the image? Well, if I held the image right up under these yellow lights, the image is going to go yellower. So is there a way around that? Is there a way I can adjust the profile so that even under these yellow lights, it looks like I'm looking at it under daylight, 
The answer is yes, and that's what we're going to explore next time with the high-end system, the i1 Display Pro 2, but uh, the i1 Pro 2 rather. But that's for next time. Let's finish up today. So wow, that's it for me. I'm out of time. Thank you guys for the great questions. You were very engaged today. You challenged me. I love that. It keeps it a lot more interesting. If you had something that was maybe a little bit too much detailed, too specific to an operating system or a printer or computer combination, send an email to answers at xwritephoto.com. We'll put that up on the screen. Uh, we'll send, if there's something that uh, is very specific beyond what I can help you with, we'll send these off to Xwrite and get their tech support people to give you a hand. So until next time, that's it from me. Thanks again for your great questions. Keep at it, keep learning, and we'll see you again soon. Until then, bye-bye.